This is their apparent, and you're watching Stormbringer, the Austrian heavy zine. Fine to have you guys here. Um, your albums are really underground classics and they are traded for a lot of money on the, on the internet, you know that? Oh, we've heard of the rumors, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do you have them at home yourself or just sold them? <laughs> well, we've sold a few over the years, yeah. but... Uh, yeah, your private own uh, issue. Yeah, yeah, the, of, of the record. The new vinyl that just yeah. came out, yeah. yeah. Yep. The, the the lyrical and uh, and musical concept behind the band was always a bit uh, it was al it was always something that mattered very much to you I guess is that right? Yeah, we always wanted to have intelligent lyrics and say something that we thought was important to say, mm. you know, either politically or or about the planet, mm. the environment, things like that. And this is still something uh, that's that's uh, that still matters today as well as like 30 years ago. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the message of the music is as true today as it was back then. You know, yeah. we are we are all the heir parents of the earth, and you know we can't let these sons of bitches t destroy it for us. Sons of bitches, <laughs> all, Sorry, all no, there. <laughs> um, the the release of the the graceful inheritance um, vinyl. Back then, came to came at the time when the when the CD was due to have a breakthrough in the in the yeah, in the business. Did you did you feel that in some some kind of way? Was it uh, was there much demand for the CD as well, or just the vinyl back in the eighties? We really have no idea. The um, technically the album uh, the contract was breached before the CD came out. So when the CD came out, we were surprised because they didn't have permission to make it. Mm. And uh, we didn't really have any contact with Black Dragon after we returned home from the tour in 86. Mm -hmm. what, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, I agree. I, we, I mean, I, I didn't even have a CD player myself when CDs first came out. Mm. You know, I was all, all vinyl myself. So the, so. So the studio, studio thing back then was all was always stressed out to, to, to bring the vinyl out and not yeah, the CD. Not CD, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We never even thought about CDs when we recorded that. Mm. Yeah. I had to go to the yeah. store and buy it myself. <laughs> you know, I, they didn't send us any. No? No. 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 That's yeah, very I, nice. I do not have a CD. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a CD of Graceful Inheritance. Do you? I, I bought you, one. You bought one? I bought one uh, yeah. 30 years ago at Tower Records. I think they got on the market. They got some. In there. Oh, so do they? Yeah. Well, maybe yeah, maybe so. you should buy one. <laughs> <laughs> to a tremendous price, yeah, a tremendous maybe. Price, yeah. <laughs> um, in the late 80s, you added, a, you added a keyboard player to the lineup. Was that something the music was demanding, or was it just uh, to, to add some, 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 some uh, stuff to the music, some, some vibes? Well, I, I always liked the idea of if we were going to add a fifth person, I thought that keyboards would give us more versatility. Mm. And we started playing around with uh, with Nathan McCoy back in back in '85 when we did uh, we did keyboards on Hands of Destiny and, and R.I.P. And um, we asked him to join the band, but he, he couldn't do it at the time. So when I, when I ended up meeting Michael after we returned from the tour uh, in '86, uh, things just kind of fell into place at that point. And uh, again, I you know. A lot of a lot of five-player bands have two guitars, and it seemed like everybody was doing that. So mm -hmm. we wanted to do something a little bit different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was like going with the flow, as well as to try to do something different. Yeah, I think it felt natural. I mean, we yeah. we uh, we've always been a fan of bands like Deep Purple and uh, Yes, and so it was a good addition. It was if you had a, if we added a guitar player, we'd be limited. We already got a guitar player. We had a keyboard player. We, Got so much more we can do. Mm. Uh, so. as, as, what style would you describe the music of Hero Parent? Anyway, is it is it like is it rock with progressive elements or something? Uh, I don't. At the time, we were just, you know, we we'd always envisioned um, kind of Rush in terms of having three instruments and and just writing stuff that that made us work hard, kept us busy, you know, yeah, yeah. and and. Uh, I guess as an extension of that, it was just a matter of challenging ourselves and trying not to sound like other bands. Mm. Um, I think it was an honest and honest representation of what we wanted to do. Mm. So, 
but at the time, Black Sabbath, Rush, Dio. We had a lot of, you know, we had a lot of influences, Maiden, but yeah. but at the same time, we 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 tried to do something that that was a little bit different, yeah. you know, and just uh, you know let other people define it. We just wanted to play music that we liked, yeah. you know, and let other people make that. I think primarily you and I've always been in original bands. Mm. We, we did a little bit of covers in one band, but um, we just always been in a, a full original band mm -hmm. writing music yeah. so the the graceful inheritance album i think is a good expression of the of the the vibe in the band at, at that time at that time yes. yeah yeah as so many bands the band started to disband when when when, when all the the grunge movement came on and you you are from seattle yeah. and so you were at the very hub of the of the whole movement so so how how did, did that feel was it really overnight that, that all this uh, real metal music went down the train yeah, I, seattle's broken into a couple different areas so metal was always more on the east side and up north grunge was in seattle mm. so it it was just a It, did, it wasn't like metal went away. Metal was still happening. When grunge hit, you had all sorts of more thrash bands coming out of the North End, Sanctuary, mm -hmm. um, Forced Entry, Bitter End. Bitter End. Mm -hmm. um, those bands were doing really good and up north. So it, the scene kind of coexist, but of course the grunge took over because it got really popular. And mm -hmm. uh, We did shows with Alice in Chains when they were called Diamond Lie. Uh, and Soundgarden was around in 1985. It's just nobody yeah, yeah, nobody heard about them until five years later. Yeah. So, I ran a night I ran a nightclub in Piner Square, where all the grunge bands played and all that stuff. So it was it was a lot. It was an amazing scene that took over. It was, it was really cool. Yeah. But over here in Europe, you had just the impression that it was only grunge overnight, and all the other bands were swept away in yeah. one well, go. Every everybody who's an overnight success spent five years getting there. Yeah. Yes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. If it's five years. Yeah. yeah. If it's three years or something. Yeah. 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 It's yeah they, they've been. Un they were. They were local Seattle bands for years before they became mm, yeah, yeah. popular. Yeah. I mean, we'd go out to the bars and see them, and it was no big deal. Then all of a sudden, wow! Everybody was moving to yeah. to Seattle yeah. all of a sudden. All these people came yeah. in starting to dress like us and act like us. Yeah. <laughs> as, as soon as as soon as New York says Seattle is cool then Seattle starts to believe it <laughs> so but but while that was happening metal was still happening on the east side yeah. and up north yeah. Yeah. yeah talking of the old bands from Seattle uh, was it is it a true story that Queensryche stole your manager at some point no 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 no, no, but, yeah, no. no but you shared a manager well, management team kind of yeah. Kim yeah. and Diane Harris were Queensryche's management team yeah. and and they had um, they had asked us to record an album and they were going to pay for it and then uh, As, as things developed with Queensryche, and they got such incredible success in a short period of time, uh, the, the band essentially demanded that they concentrate on them 100%. And you can't blame them. I mean, they were, they were going to Tokyo, and they were going to London, and they were doing all kinds of things. The band wanted their 100% focus, so it makes sense. You know, it was unfortunate for us because of the circumstances, but, you know, it, it is what it is. You can't blame them for the decisions that they made. Had it, had it any, uh, did it have any influence on the on the development of the band, or did it just uh, it, it, went on? Uh, was it a drawback for you? It slowed us down for a couple of years yeah. because you know we we had to find our own financing and and borrow money from friends and family to record our demos and things. After that, it it, it slowed us down for about two years, mm -hmm. and by then the scene changes a little bit. So you know who knows? Yeah. You know. Never can say. It's the scene always changes, seems to change yeah, as it is. it is, because you're back now and this is like 30 years later. And uh, uh, what's, what's the main thing for you in, in the feeling as a band uh, with, the, with the audience and all, uh, what changed a lot? Is it, is it the communication or the internet or the, the MP3 thing or anything? Uh, I really, I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, it, just the fact that the, the first album went over so well and kind of became a cult classic, you know, um, is really what's enabled us to continue on the way we have. Mm. And uh, we love it. We're, right now we're playing really good with each other and we're really enjoying ourselves, having a great time. We got Will Smith singing with us now and he, he's like a natural for the band. He fits the combination, the, having S Steve and Paul, the two different singers on the, on the two albums, he's a perfect blend of both of them. He can do both really well, and that's so. It's it's a lot of fun. So there might be a new record. 
in, in, in the pipeline? Yeah, we're we're um, we're starting to write some things now that, that feel pretty good. So, yeah, the the hope is to have an album out uh, hopefully within a year. So we'll see what happens. We're working might on it. Excite some fans out there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. The, the one thing that's that's really been amazing to us and and very, um, you know, very flattering is is the idea that uh, that the European audience primarily has has developed a, a, an affection for a lot of Seattle metal bands in the 80s um, before the grunge scene took over. And and it's like once once a, a, a fan is a fan in Europe, they're a fan forever, which is which is which is uh, it, it's it's really an honor for us to have people um, give us this kind of reception after all this time. I guess it's an honor for the people to have you here after all those years because yeah, yeah other bands are gone. You know? Yeah, it's amazing seeing. Uh, People come to the shows who were probably one years old when we, yeah. <laughs> or and not even born yet, you know. Yeah. 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 With the parents. Yeah, with the parents. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I did see uh, we, when we played Wacken in 2000. Um, a girl that I met on our first tour mm -hmm. came to the show and she was standing out there and she was like, "These are my kids," you know, and her kids were all this <laughs> big. It was like, wow, it was really cool. Uh, back in the 80s, you were uh, you were signing a seven album deal back then, I guess. <laughs> A seven album deal, yeah. Without any, uh, without even knowing about the future of the band, was it was this the standard back then to sign deals with like for like seven <laughs> albums is like a period of like 14 years. Well, the, the deal with Metal Blade Capital was was for seven albums. It was, but it's all conditional on on the next album, right? If if the next album doesn't do well, there there's not a second or a third or let alone seven. So it, it's it basically was a contract that that. Had we been successful, they would have controlled us for seven more albums. Mm. But uh, you know, things didn't work out that way. Yeah. So yeah. At, least, at least there is a new one in the pipeline. So maybe this is maybe a fulfillment of the deal. Mm. Ish <laughs> yeah, no. kind of thing. No, yeah. I'm joking. I, I think I think anybody would be silly to sign a seven album deal today. Mm. You know, with the way things are today, the yeah. the way it, the internet is and the way music is moving, but. Yeah. yeah, at the time but it was a, at the time it was a stepping stone. You know, it, 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 the the situation for seven albums is is you know they they say seven albums and six hundred thousand dollars and it doesn't really mean anything because the first album budget is twenty five thousand, mm. second is maybe fifty, the third's maybe a hundred and twenty. So the six hundred thousand dollars happens over the course of seven recording budgets, yeah. and they get bigger each time. But you start off small, and you have to. You know, you have to earn it all the way through, and uh, and now the business has totally changed. So now it's it's in a band's best interest to kind of be independent, uh, unless a record company offers a lot of money for tour support, um, which they don't. Which yeah, which they don't. normally. So you know, we have to uh, we have to just promote ourselves and and uh, and try to do the best we can and keep our day jobs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But and keep it true. <laughs> we wanted to do nothing but play music back then. I mean, that's what we wanted to do. So, it could have been a 20 album deal. We would have taken it, yeah, if, as long as we could play music, you know. What about the festival here? Well, do you like it? It's the first time? Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it just look at all these people. It's crazy. Yeah, it's. It, we're really looking forward to tomorrow night. It's a, it's a, it's a huge venue. There's. Lots of great people here, lots of familiar faces yeah, too, so yeah, yeah, yeah. it should be a lot of fun. Lots of bands that have been away for like forever and now they are back again, like you. Yeah. So um, yeah, I say thank you yeah. to you guys. So and what, what do you think about the metal scene in Europe? Oh, what do I think? What do I think about the metal scene in Europe? Uh, yeah, basically I like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it changed, of course it changed, but it's it, it differs a bit from the scene in, in America, I guess. Really I've been over too. there twice, and and yeah, the fan, the fan, being a fan there means something different, like than being a fan in St. Germany or something. Yeah, I guess that's what I felt. Yeah, because uh, I, 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 I feel people are more dedicated here. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and and they stay dedicated over the years. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's nothing against the American people, but they don't are that focused on the music, I guess. Yeah, we're, we're running into people we saw in Italy, we saw in Greece, we saw somebody here today that was at uh, our first tour back in 86, you know, and they, and they come here because they just love the music. Yeah. So it's fantastic, yeah. And they bring their kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you guys, and uh, I hope the next record will be out soon, and it will be a smasher.
going to be good. Thank you.